OK, um, I'm going to talk about design systems and uh, React. Um, my name is Diana, uh, as Guillermo said, also known as Broccolini um, on the internet. Uh, I am a design operations manager at GitHub. Uh, the key word to take away there is manager. I don't write quite as much code this year as I used to, and uh, we've just started building our design system in React, so I apologize if I get any uh, uh, terminology wrong, but I'll do my best. Uh, I've been working on design system for quite a long time. Um, at GitHub, we've, been, we've had a design systems team for uh, about two and a half years now. And I wanted to start off by just uh, making sure uh, everyone understands what a design system is, because I know that um, there are kind of a lot of different interpretations of that. So at GitHub, um, design systems are rules, principles, and constraints, and they are implemented in design and code. So an example of that, um, if we use color as an example, a rule might be a minimum contrast ratio of 451. A constraint could be the number of colors in the palette. And a principle could be to use color in a meaningful way. An implementation example of this um, could be a flash alert message. So the dark red and the light red have to pass color contrast. Um, and uh, the color has a meaning of like something wrong. There's something wrong. There's an error. Uh, and uh, it, the colors are from the color palette. And this is the code for how to implement it. And this is what it looks like. So that's what design systems are to us. Uh, some context, uh, design, uh, GitHub is uh, 10 years old. Um, that means about 10 years of people contributing design and code debt. Um, uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's worked on large scale applications and that are old and can imagine what that's like. Uh, it's also, uh, github.com is a Ruby on Rails monolith. Uh, and so when we started the design systems team, it didn't really feel like we could just go, oh, hey, can we build this in React or something else? And so we couldn't really stop that train and say, hey, everyone, we want to build this, all this new stuff straight from scratch. We kind of had to figure out what could we do while the train was still moving. Uh, so that's where we just started to work with Primer CSS. And um, Primer is the name of our design system. And we wanted to see how much we could fix with just CSS alone. So we drew principles from things like object-oriented CSS, um, which Nicole Sullivan came up with. Um, uh, we use techniques like uh, BEM to structure and, na and provide naming conventions for our CSS components. And we had things called utilities that some people might call functional CSS. And they were single purpose classes that meant to do one thing and one thing only. And all those things started to help. It, it helped us mean that um, people no longer really had to write um, a, a lot of new CSS. So that kind of just m increased and made that kind of implementation workflow just a little bit faster. Um, it's also, it also made it easier for people to design in the browser. And at GitHub, all our designers also code as well. And so that was really, really important for us. They want to be able to tweak and try different layouts and, and iterate on designs in code. We also built these uh, new system styles on actual systems. In a way, design systems are just systems on systems on systems. So when we design things like our typography scale, we don't just look at the font sizes. We look at how that works with the line height um, so that we try and uh, arrive on, like, land on like, more sensible uh, numbers, whole numbers, as much as possible. Um, by the way, don't ever uh, pick 14 pixels as your font size. It's a nightmare. <laughs> um, it will never land in a whole number, or not easily. Uh, and, and so we also then, of course, look at how those um, small um, primitive elements of a design system work in the context of components and pages and views. So that started to make things work more harmoniously together. But there were still a lot of problems. Um, we started to get a lot of classes in the markup, which um, not everyone really likes, can get a little bit hard to maintain. We would have lots and lots of uh, repeated blocks of markup um, that we didn't have a way of sharing that same um, chunk of code easily around the code base. We had a lot of duplication. Um, so this is an example of something that's actually in our code base right now called Wikilist. Probably can guess what it is. Uh, and this is issue list, exactly the same property value pairs, different class name. Uh, so that's not great. Uh, and the other thing is that CSS is kind of leaky, and sometimes it leaks over things that you don't really want it to. 
Um, one of the, that's led to like p parts of the code base where we're kind of scared to touch that. Um, this is just a screenshot from um, part of our, what we call a discussion timeline. So the discussion timeline is the thing that you see in pull requests and issues that connects all the events that are happening. Well, that's what we call the uh, CSS. It is like the, one of the biggest sources of bug, UI bugs for us. And it's, it's a big problem because every time someone wants to build a new feature or add something that interacts with that discussion timeline CSS, they're going to spend a chunk of time battling CSS problems instead of like iterating on that feature and making sure it works really well. And then some of you might have seen this tweet. <laughs> um, the expectations of users have changed over the years. And so some parts of GitHub kind of feel a bit dated and don't act to um, uh, respond and interact with you as, uh, as users would expect. So for those reasons and, and many more, we started to work on building um, a, a React component library with Primer this year. So I want to talk about where we started and how we've been going about it. So to start off with, we decided that we didn't want to start by write, rewriting all of our CSS. So we used a, a library called class names, and we just started to like understand how to build components and referring to those um, that CSS that still lives in Primer. Um, I it might not be what we really want it to be, and this is this definitely not like what we want long term. But I think in the early stages, it's much better to make progress than to have like the most correct out like implementation of what you want in the future. Um, we started off with, really, I just wanted to clarify with everyone that our, our design system is present, what we call presentational components, and Dan Abranov has written a very well-known article about that. So our design system is, at the moment, only presentation, uh, uh, presentational components that are about how things look. Now, over time, we might need certain types of container po components. Oh, saying components a lot is hard. <laughs> um, uh, so for things, maybe like for things like forms and stuff like that. But right now we're just focusing on those on those visual things. The other thing that we need to think about with building design systems at GitHub is that GitHub.com is not the only website or web application that we're building this for. We have many other um, web apps and websites, and this has led us to talk about like, well, um, what like. Do all these sites need to look like GitHub? And one of my colleagues, Sophie, on the uh, web design team talks about, um, we, we came up with this phrase of like brand um, on a spectrum. So when uh, we're looking at uh, github.com, there's really no, we don't want any flexibility in terms of how the brand is represented. But when we get further away from that, where it's something like a conference where we have more like super fans going, we can be a bit more experimental and fun and flexible with that. So that means we need to build a design system that um, provides enough flexibility, but also consistency where we need it when we are in that like no flexible zone. And this is where I find it interesting that some of those same principles that we use to um, uh, design our CSS still apply when we get to React. Um, so separate structure and skin is from the object-oriented CSS principles by Nicole Sullivan. And I'll talk through a little bit about what that sort of looks like in practice. So our styles kind of land into kind of three categories. And, and not all some sites will get all of these, and some won't, depending on where they are in that, that brand um, spectrum. So layout, um, display, um, position, padding, margin is pretty much useful for like any website or application that you built. Uh, and then we have like common components like alerts and buttons and labels and things. And they're usually useful for web applications, obviously like github.com, but might not be useful in a marketing site. And then we have the, the theme, the, the colors, the typography scale, the spacing scale, the things that make it look, help it make it look like GitHub. And um, those theme values are used in both those common components and also in, the, in those um, uh, layout components, because that's where we use our like spacing scale and things like that. And ideally, um, uh, you know, when we're in that like no flexible zone, we're going to use the the standard primer theme. But when we get further away from that, we might want to swap out what the values of that theme are and still ideally still have like the same markup for those components and layout styles. So as we got further into building um, Primer React, um, we started to ha struggle with some the flexibility that we needed. And this is when we started to uh, explore 
using a library called Style System and uh, Emotion.js. And we, we're using this alongside some of the existing Primus CSS. And we call, uh, uh, that was to create these things that we call system props to share those kind of system styles. So it means that we end up like with a theme uh, JS file that contains all the values for the typography and color and spacing and things like that. And, and then we started to notice that uh, after being a bit too restrictive about how we were sharing those, we found that um, there were kind of common categories that components fell into. So now we give all our components color and space. 90% of the time they need, the, need to have that flexibility. We give all our typography components things like text or a label or a counter component. We give those font size, font weight, line height, that sort of thing. And then our layout components, things like box to us is like our box model component and like <coughs> flex. Um, we give those the display and width um, uh, props. So this means that people can then create um, new components um, in their applications with Primary React, and they've got a lot of flexibility, but they can still keep it, um, they can still use the theme when they want to, or they can change out what the theme is behind that. They can use the, the R components out of the box if they want to, or they can create brand new ones. And so as we started to work through this, we started to create our own principles, borrowing them from other areas, like uh, everything is a component, um, which was uh, from thinking, uh, inspired by thinking uh, in React. And we had some questions about this. So uh, people were like, well, why wouldn't I just use like uh, an H1 um, uh, instead of like, you, why do I need a heading component? And we st in, for the teams that have started out building React, we saw a lot of the not this section in the early stages. And we talked to them and we're like, well, that doesn't help with this problem because then we're relying on CSS inheritance. And sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. What we want is we want that encapsulation. So we want everything as a component so that we can keep all those styles and anything else encapsulated and keep that mess just in there and reduce the amount of damage it can do. Uh, and then there's a, another principle that we, we're trying to follow is the minimal API surface area, which is, is from Sebastian and uh, Mark Wedge's talk. Uh, and that to us, um, it means that we want the API of the design system to be really quickly learnable and predictable and easy to pick up. Um, a lot of people just don't read documentation ever. They just want to learn by doing. Um, so we, we try and do that by reusing patterns. So this is where system props are really nice because if you learn how to use the color prop on, one, on the box component, it works the same on the text component. Um, we have another type of prop called scheme props, which are like com uh, combinations of colors. And so if you learn to use that on the label prop, you know how that, uh, the label component, you know how to use that on the flash. Some other tips, uh, you may have heard this one, uh, the apocalypse. I really, I'm so glad I nailed that because I find it really hard to say. Um, so Girl Code uh, um, did this presentation and uh, yeah, basically if you find yourself having something like this, then maybe you should make some more components out of that. But I would go and look up her talk, she really does a great deep dive into that. Uh, and another thing that we found, we have a lot of conversations in Slack and, and meetings and we found ourselves getting a little bit confused at time. And, and so we've started to uh, have this sort of readme driven development principle. I highly recommend design the public API before you actually write the code for the component because you can have much clearer, simpler discussions around that. So finally, uh, do we have component, React components in github.com? Not yet. Uh, <laughs> so we're not sure where we're going to go with that. Um, we've got a, it's a big monolith. Um, obviously, you, you probably all know that we, we have GraphQL, and like maybe we'll start um, pulling things out of the monolith and building on top of that GraphQL layer. And there are some teams um, kind of starting to do that. We're also looking at like maybe we can start to introduce components and update like that a certain component across uh, many ERB templates. Um, but that's to be continued. So uh, yeah, watch the space. And thank you very much.